The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. You guys do understand this could be a horrific, horrible incident that took place. This has me highly concerned. I was finding out some details, actually, as it happened. And um, well, this could be bad. This will bolster one thing nobody needed. It's very different times. If anything happens to the Iranian leader, they will tie it back to the Mossad. They're going to use it to muster support of a people who was once neutral. If it works, I think we all know the outcome of that. I think all of us do. Okay, the date is 5-19-2024. And today's incident deals with the Iranian president. The aircraft went down, the helicopter went down. Now, just to explain the situation, this could be a terrible, horrible incident. It really could be. Iran has been looking for some sort of an excuse to bolster support of its attacks in the Middle East. This would be the perfect opportunity to cause some sort of motivation with the young people and believe me, an act like this could do it. So naturally, this will be blamed on either Israel, specifically the Mossad and America. They will utilize this to go forward with the plans that they do have. This is very concerning, extremely concerning, because if the young people who are soldiers and then the, the proxies are in fact motivated by this to double up their efforts in attacking Israel and their plot schemes and plans in the USA and abroad. We're looking at a combat situation that will spread like a disease and it will be unstoppable due to the sheer number of those who have an actual loyalty to Iran who are placed all throughout the Western world. It'll also cause a great sympathy of those who right now are supporting the Gazan people, a great percentage of those folks will then begin to be a bit supportive of any cry that comes from Iran. So this could be a bad situation, very bad. If in fact anything happens to the president, you guys should be highly aware that this will be the next step in a global wildfire, so to speak. This will be part of the call of the beginning of a war that everybody will recognize and most will be involved with. Killing a president is a declaration of war, period. If you assassinate a president and you are a foreign entity, that's a declaration of war. If they blame it on Israel, they, by their own policies, will actually begin to utilize some of the large weaponry or some of the more sophisticated weapons that have not been used. They will have an international excuse to attack whomever killed the president. Now that's international law. It's not like a situation before where they tried to attack a nation because they didn't like them. This will be totally excusable. The world may not like it, but by international law, they have a right to retaliate. And because it was the, if, if that president dies, they have a right also. The blue turban guy is coming forward. If that person comes forward, well, that's it. That's all it's pure. That's going to be it. A blue turban means that a blue turban is actually a designation for a certain type of leader who will not rule like any other. Right? If, in fact, they don that blue turban by their own decree, this guy will cause the world to enter into a very um, unfavorable, war. very unfavorable. So if this takes place, and this could be the one, this could really be the one, we're going to find out, unfortunately, this, you know, this is a very serious problem. Now, the world may not see it that way. I know a lot of people, and I hope they don't do this, but publicly, they're going to clap their hands. Uh, of course, Iran is going to demand some sort of, of apology if that president is dead. Either way, somebody else is going to step up, and whoever steps up, we need to walk biblical uh, events very closely. We need to do that. If the president is dead, they're still going to make that declaration of retaliation against anyone who attacked them. That means they're going to use their sophisticated line of weaponry, and they will have legal prowess to do that. The world may not like it, 
but they are likely to do it. Also, their young people are spread out too much. They're all over the place. What you may not know is that a large percentage of chatter dealing with a lot of young people goes right back to Iran. Iran somehow has gained favor in the eyes of youth all around the world. No one is quite sure how that happened, but they have great sympathy to those who are of the you know, younger age folks. And they outnumber us, of course. So if you think these folks who are protesting uh, the USA's actions in the Middle East and the Hamas uh, that are support of, supporting Hamas and the Gaza people, those who are protesting the USA's action right in our homeland against Israel. If you think that's bad, you've seen nothing yet. And according to the word of God, uh, because I have to use that as an anchor, when you deal with the lineage of this person that's going to come forward, it comes out of the root of Persia, out of the root of Persia, according to the book of Daniel. Now, I know a lot of people have different ideas, but I tend to track the roots in the Bible the branches and where these people are branched out from. For example, Persia was split up into four parts. Now, those four parts became four different provinces in the Middle East. One of those is a Tibetan brand, believe it or not, so it deals with China. Did you guys know that? That's out of Persia. The original Persian people, that when they split up into four different quadrants, one of them became the Chinese people. Are you guys aware of that? So China, Tibetan, all those folks are out of the root of Persia. They're out of that root. In the Middle East, of course, it's a lot of uh, everything is mixed up. But when you start tracking the book of Daniel, specifically the book of Daniel, which I, this is my belief, I think that Daniel chapter 11 is in fact a battle plan. And it is laid out very nicely, very clearly. There is no ambiguity in that chapter at all. It is quite clear. It's just quite clear. But you have a king that falls, neither by war nor by anything else, and somebody stands up in his place, right, by, by um, proxy, and is dead by proxy, so they weren't elected. They kind of took over that position. Then that one falls, and a vile person stands up. This vile person is the one we're looking at. In fact, if uh, anybody wants to find that, that's, of course, Daniel, Daniel chapter 11. And when we go back to... In Daniel chapter 11, uh, we're going to go back to Daniel chapter 11, 7. But out of the branch of a root shall stand up in his estate, which shall come in with an army, shall enter in the fortress of the king of the north, shall deal against him, and shall prevail. This is troubling. Daniel 11, 7 is troubling. Let me go back. Here it is. Let me read the whole thing. Daniel 11, 2. And now I will show thee the truth. This is the angel addressing Daniel. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength and through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Gratia. And a mighty king shall stand up, that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven. That's the splitting of that kingdom into four portions. Not to his prosperity, nor according to his dominion. Now, it's not according to its dominion. The lands that he possessed is going to be split up into four quadrants outside of his will. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. And the king of the south shall be strong and one of his princes shall be strong, strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be great dominion. Now remember, the king of the south is not the person of interest here. The king of the north is. And in the end of years, they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of the arm, the army, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up. And they that fought her and they that begat her and he that strengthened her in these times. But out of the branch of the root shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against him, and shall prevail, and shall also carry captives into Egypt their gods with their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold. And he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south, shall come into his kingdom and shall return to his own land. But his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces 
And one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through, and then shall he return and be stirred up, even to his fortress. Now all this in Daniel chapter 2 to Daniel chapter uh, 12 it is. It's outlined also in the book of Ezekiel. It's also um, the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah really give a um, give some details about this separation of that land, the, the entire dismantling uh, of that land. So let's let's continue though. So the king of the south, this is Daniel 11, 9. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return to his own land, but a son shall be stirred up again, shall assemble a multitude of great forces. One shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return be stirred up, even to his fortress. And the king of the south shall be moved with choler or anger, and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. He shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. This is a nullifying event. In Daniel eleven twelve. And when he have taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up. He shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not, sta- he shall not be strengthened by it. For the king of the north shall return, shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with great riches. Now we have a time gap. In Daniel eleven thirteen, after many years he returns. The king of the north returns after many years. Daniel eleven thirteen is a time gap or, or a, a space of time we're dealing with here. Daniel eleven fourteen, and in those times. There shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. Now, let me make something clear. The angel is addressing Daniel. He's talking to Daniel. So, in 11.14, the angel says, And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also, the robbers of thy people. Whose people? Daniel's people. Also, the robbers of Daniel, your people, shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. It's not going to work. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand. Neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. He shall also set his face to enter in with the strength of his whole kingdom, the upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of woman corrupting her. But she shall not stand on his side, neither before him to give somebody the daughter of woman. We're not talking about a person here. We're talking about some sort of a promise, some sort of a, some sort of collateral we're talking about. This word daughter implies something from somebody else. Let's continue Daniel 11.8. After this, he shall return his face unto the isles and take many. But the prince of his own behalf shall cause reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause him to turn upon him. Then he shall turn his face towards the fort of his own land, but it shall summon the fall and not be found. Now track this. With Daniel eleven nineteen. Here, here it begins. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, that is, with the approval of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be destroyed neither in anger nor in battle. So you have one king that stands up, one king, but he stumbles and falls and he's not found. In the same lineage, you have another king that stands up in his estate or in his place. He's a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days, he is destroyed too, neither in anger nor in battle. That's two that fell. And in his estate shall stand a vile person. Now that Daniel eleven twenty one is the person we're looking for. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So the two before this notable king, they fell. Neither they didn't fall in battle. They were just, they just fell. Then this third king rises up in their state, but they do not give him the honor of the kingdom, which means they don't like him. Right, kind of like the Trump situation. The province does not like this guy, but the people like this guy. And it says he comes in peaceably and he obtains the kingdom by flattery. So obviously, if he obtains a kingdom by flatteries, he's telling them exactly what they want to hear. But at first, they did not want him to have the kingdom. 
So now you can see that situation. Then it goes on, and with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Now the prince of the covenant. There's only one covenant. The angel is talking to Daniel. There's only one covenant. There's not two. There's not three. There's one covenant. So the prince of the covenant would be the prince of the promise, and we're talking future tense. The prince of the promise. That we know who, who, what the covenant is. That's the land of Israel. So the prince of the covenant, even in the book of Daniel 11:22, there was a prophesied return of Israel. And that's something with a leader over Israel. And after a league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. So here's the situation. This guy stands up. He's a vile person. He overcomes them by flattery. He's telling them what they want to hear. And with the arms of a flood, his work, with his, the work he's doing, the, the rhetoric he's spewing, right? Everybody is taken by this guy, even the prince of the covenant, even the prince of the covenant. So everybody is broken by this guy. This guy does the unbelievable thing, and everybody is broken by this guy, even the prince of the covenant. And, and it says, after a league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. So after a league is in agreement, after the league made with him, he's going to work deceitfully. For he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. Now, what does that mean? You know, when you look at this, there's somebody who comes up. First of all, this guy stands up. He's, he's the leader of some place. He comes up and becomes strong with the small people. After a closer examination, I want you to enter this into your mind. After a league made with him, after he is positioned officially, he's officially positioned. Now, this could mean this guy is simply in that elected position, and he's permanently put in that elected position. I know what everybody else is saying, but I just want you to hear something. It says, after a league made with him, this word league is very consistent, biblically. A covenant with many. Do you not know that a president enters into a covenant with many when he takes his term of office? Do you not know that that's a covenant? Do you guys know that? Do you know that to take the position of a president is a covenant? You know, sometimes we relate the language of the Bible to a context of the word base that we have in our own native language. We do that. So when it says an agreement, he's going to be in an agreement with many. And then you start looking at what Daniel's talking about. He's, he's talking about the context of this guy's own country. They did not want to give him the honor of the kingdom. They didn't want him, but he overcame them. And then all of a sudden, it says, after a league is made with him, he's going to work deceitfully. It's almost like he gets the, in this position of power officially. And when that happens, he starts working deceitfully. Now, let's continue. Listen, for he shall come up and shall become strong with the small people. You know, at first sight, this could be taken as a little tiny country. But I want you to think about something. What if this guy accepts his role as whatever, president, uh, or whatever it is. But then he has his select individuals out of that place to start doing something nobody, nobody knows about. To come up and become strong with the small people is no different than some, say an independent gets elected in America, and then that person gets in power. He gets into a covenant. He's president. And then he takes other independents and starts positioning them in places of power. Wouldn't that be him coming up with the small people, with the minority, coming up with the small people, with the minority, right? So just think about that. Because... In the end, the Father is going to be right. I'm not trying to solve prophecy. That's not what I do. I don't solve prophecy. I rely upon God's revelation to see what's happening. That's what I rely upon. And every time, you know, as seasons continue to pass, God's word is going to become clearer and clearer. I do not want to be like those in the time of Christ who were locked into their own ending, so much so that they could not see anything else. I'm going to always be open to God's revelation. So I'll never come up with some definitive answer. I'll never do that. I rely upon him. But we do know this guy comes up and becomes strong with the small people. I'm just showing you something. Because I know that God foreshadows everything he does. Let me continue. And after a league made with him, he'll work deceitfully. Only after this league is made with him, he's going to work deceitfully. It says, and then it gives you an explanation as to what that is. For he shall come up 
He shall become strong with the small people. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. So he starts going to the richest places there are. Now this shows you something else. If it's a worn, torn place, how can there be fat places? A fat place means overabundant place. If you're at war, there is no overabundant place. This guy, it says, shall enter in peaceably, and even go. he's going to the fattest places of the province. Listen, he shall do according to that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He's going to scatter among them the prey, the spoil, the riches. Now his fathers have not done this, his father's fathers have not done this, so what is he doing? He's causing, he's distributing things. This is, uh, what was that term people used to use? Distribution of wealth is what he's doing. So he's causing his, the wealth to spread around to everybody. And naturally, everybody is probably, he's causing prosperity to happen. To scatter among them the prey, the spoils, and the riches is to take whatever you have gotten for yourselves, whatever riches that you have for yourselves, and begin to destroy uh, or uh, distribute that all throughout the land so naturally if he does this then people are going to be like oh yes this guy is that's my guy right there see we're doing better see, that, that's one warning i have for americans when they start touting for some president and they say oh yes like they did trump like they did obama uh, they did the same things they said oh yes he made our country better he did this be cautioned that these end times figures when they start doing things and answering the most rudimental that or, or starting these uh, prosperity kicks for everybody in every place in the word of god that's not going to strengthen the kingdom of god that strengthens a person's position in the world do you know that if god were to make every single last one of you rich your position in the world would be strengthened not your position with him think about that and what are people asking for they want peace and prosperity. They want peace and safety and more riches. Well, if people get more riches, you know and I know, they're going to start losing the spirit man of who they actually are. They're going to indulge in these things of the world. Their language changes. I noticed that if you see a person go from average to rich, they change. They do. They start saying that small things that they would never agree with are okay well that's okay well this is okay well this isn't that bad well god understands and god knows this and and god knows no riches will cause you to become a servant of the world so quickly and then when you build that lifestyle you're going to start doing anything to keep it even compromising the word of god this is probably not the right time for that God will always supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. But I ask you a question. Why would God give me everything I want? Why would God go above that only to have me start stumbling at his word? He's not going to do that. God's not going to do anything that's going to cause us to get away from him. He's going to do everything that will cause us to go closer to him. And it really is based on us. But you point out one human being who can be filthy rich and praise the Lord in truth. Because for one... If you're rich, you can answer your own prayers. You can. So that means in order to say thank you, Lord, and you're rich, you're going to have to dig down even deeper to find something even more significant than the average person. Just to have that true heartfelt thank you, Lord. Do you guys understand? When you don't have a lot, you thank God over the smallest things. You also realize that your life is fragile and you depend upon the Lord. The more you have, the less dependency you have upon the most time. Think about that. And what are people asking for? They want to be able to relax in their homes, don't they? You don't hear not one of them saying, you know, we want a president who's going to really lead us according, you know, to the word, because they can't do that. They can't do that. And if people start getting prosperous, I'm telling you right now, they're going to indulge. Somebody may say, well, how do you know that? Because God will do, he'll supply our needs according to his riches and glory. He will raise us and keep us, but he's not going to do anything that's going to cause us to stray away. God has already tested a great many people with riches, with excess, with abundance. Plus, if you die with abundance by the word of God, you're the one in the wrong. If you die with your riches, your soul is going to be lost. Do you know why? Because when you were keeping your riches, somebody was starving and you knew about it. 
How do you justify that in the eyes of the Most High? Think about that. So to have money in this world and still be true to your Lord and Savior is a huge responsibility. It is a huge one. Can you see? How can I, if I were to die right now, and I had abundance right now, and it was sitting in the bank, but people have been starving every single day. There are homeless people every single day. How could I stand before the Most High? And He knows exactly what I had, and I die with all that blood on my hands because I did not utilize my power to honor the Lord. You know, we're supposed to love him with all of our strength, with all of our power. Whatever power you have, you're supposed to love the Lord with it. How do you do that? That means with anything that makes you powerful, with anything that empowers you, you love the Lord with it. So if you die with a bunch of loot, your bank is full and everything else, that's just not going to look good. That's why in the Bible, these rich people, did you see how they lived their lives? Did you notice what they did and what they did not do? Did you see that? Did you see what they did? Did you ever study what they actually did? Because I did. Because I could never justify find that in my mind. How can a person stand before the living God at the very end, having the power to feed millions, yet they didn't do it? That means you have to be trained. You have to be trained. You had to be bought up in the Lord to have that type of money because you become a faucet, not to keep it, but to give it. That's why God does not bless those who won't give anything away. Because if he can't pour something through you, why would he give it to you in the first place? Why would he give anybody anything just to store it up when he said, do not store your riches up on earth? That's what he said. Didn't he say that? Don't store your riches up on this earth. That's exactly what he said. So if he prepares you, if you're going to be, if you're a rich guy for the kingdom, you're going to handle a lot of resources. That's a big responsibility, period. So you have to become a faucet. So when the Lord blesses you, you can't be afraid to pour out again. If a faucet turns itself off, nobody gets water. But all it has to do is be turned on again, and it will pour out its contents to everybody. And one of the disconnects is people are afraid to pour out. They're afraid because they say, well, nothing may not pour back in again. That's what they'll say. It may not pour back in again. I love the Lord, how the Lord works. The Lord will have you an empty faucet, and he'll say, open it. And then you'll sit there like, open it for what? There's nothing that's going to come out. Now, he didn't ask you anything but to open the faucet, to open yourself to everybody else, right? And whoever is bold enough and obedient enough to open it when there's nothing coming in the top, when they open it, he'll supply as that faucet opens. See how that works? That's how God supplies. God supplies as it is needed. So if you open the faucet, the water contents pour in. It'll pour into you so you can pour out. If you close the faucet, he'll not pour anything into you. That's why in the Bible it says, do not withhold your hand from your own flesh. That's why it says that. It says charity starts at home. That's why it says that. And we are to live our lives by faith, not by sight, but by faith. So when a person is open, and they say, you know what? I wouldn't have this anyway if the Lord didn't allow me to live this very day. So let me open up the faucet and Lord guide and lead me as this faucet is open. He'll do that for you. He really will. But it must be by faith. You all say, I hope you all see that. Hope everybody sees that everything we do must be by faith here on this earth. Let me go back to this. So after a league made with him, he works deceitfully. He comes up and shall become strong with small people. He shall enter peacefully upon the fattest places of the province. He shall do according to that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey, the spoils, and the riches, yea. He shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to do battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Now, the king of the south, and I know a lot of people have not read Daniel, the whole thing in context, but you'll find out the king of the south is also the prince of the holy covenant. The king of the south is the prince of the holy covenant. When you read this in context, especially in Daniel 11, 27, and 28, you see holy covenant. Daniel 11, 30, you see holy covenant twice. The king of the south is the prince of the holy covenant, in which king of the north has indignation against the holy covenant. That's why Daniel 11, 30 says, and he'll have indignation against the holy covenant. It's talking about the king of the north. He'll even have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. 
And then it talks about the king of the north polluting the sanctuary of strength to take away the daily sacrifice and to place the abomination that makes it desolate. Now the Antichrist sets up the abomination of desolation. The Antichrist does this. But what does he overcome? He overcomes the prince of the holy covenant. He overcomes the holy covenant. He pollutes the sanctuary of strength. So the prince of the holy covenant, king of the north, and the king of the south, the king of the south is the prince of the holy covenant. The king of the north is that questionable element we're talking about. Daniel 11, 26, Yea, that they that feed of a portion of his meat shall destroy him. That's a principle. Daniel 11, 26 is a godly principle. It really is. They that feed of a portion of his meat shall destroy him. That's called betrayal. And his army shall overflow and many shall fall down slain. And both these kings' hearts who? The king of the north and the king of the south. The king of the south is the prince of the holy covenant. Both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief. It is very unfortunate that every time you talk about Israel in a very true context, people get highly offended to the point where they don't want that to be. But we're not going by what we want to be. We, it, it will pay us to know these prophecies. Because people are going to get their little feelings hurt when things unfold. Both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table. That's politics. But it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at an appointed time. So this tells you something in Daniel eleven twenty seven. Both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief. But it says, but it says what? At the end, it says, for the end is at an appointed time, which means these two kings have the ability to do what? To bring about what? The absolute end. The other word. It says, then shall he return to his own land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. And he shall do exploits and return to his own land, which means... Now, here's the situation. It says, They that feed of a portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. Who's he talking about? The king of the north. He just said that like Daniel eleven twenty five. The king of the north. And it says, And both these kings' heart shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at an appointed time. And at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or the latter. He's talking about the king of the north. He says, for the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. Now, let, here it is right here. He, he just said it. Then shall he return to his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. And he shall do exploits and return to his own land. Who? The king of the north. So he, who's he talking to? Who would he talk to that when he goes back home, his heart would be against the holy covenant? I cannot talk to some stranger and then my heart is against, you know, the holy person over here. I have to talk to the holy person. And then if he boots me out, my heart will be against the holy person. You see how that works? You can't talk to a stranger and then your heart be against somebody totally different. No. You were just talking to the object of this whole thing and it didn't work and you went back home and you didn't like the guy because you couldn't have your way over him. So this king of the north comes to talk to the king of the south and it does not go so well. And he has the king of the north has to go back home and it says his heart is against the holy covenant. There's only one holy covenant. Remember the angel is talking to Daniel. Why in the world would Gabriel call any of the place holy to have a holy covenant? No the place has a holy covenant. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or the latter. He's still talking about this northern guy. For the ships of Ketim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. There it is again. He shall even return and have intelligence or information with them that forsake the holy covenant. So the king of the south goes back, involves other nations and other groups and now they have information or intelligence that forsake the holy covenant they have information they can use against the holy covenant that will forsake it how do you forsake the holy covenant destroy it. they have information on how to destroy the holy covenant they have information on how to destroy israel they have information on how to destroy israel which means how to take it over. What do you think Iran is doing right now? And, and it says, and arms shall stand on his part. Whose part? The king of the north. 
and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and take away the daily sacrifice. And they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. So you're looking at a bunch of people who forsook the Holy Covenant, who now have information to forsake the Holy Covenant or to overtake his reign. And they get together and they do it. You see some of that happening right now through Hamas, through Hezbollah, through the Houthis, Iran directly. That's what you're saying. You're seeing people who forsake the Holy Covenant, people who say that Israel should be wiped off the map. And they're getting together. And at some point, they're going to 100% succeed. So the king of the north is going to get others with him and take the king of the south. The king of the south is the prince of the holy covenant. There's only one holy covenant. That's what I want you to see. In the context of Daniel chapter 11, when you read this whole thing, you can see it so clear. And they will do it. They most certainly will. What I'm telling you is, say the president is dead, it's only going to bolster or motivate many other people to join in with the current plot to forsake the Holy Covenant. We all know what happens when they succeed, when they forsake the Holy Covenant. God said those in Judea flee into the mountains. That's what Jesus said to them in the book of Matthew. Don't go back to take anything out of your houses. Run. That's what he said. Yeah, that works. Somebody said so in Isaiah. Let me see where it talks about it. If they have broken the Holy Covenant, therefore it cursed the bowels of the earth. Is that also regarding Israel? And Isaiah is talking about the inhabitants of the earth. It's just talk, it's talking about the inhabitants of the earth. When you see that, you have to see that in context. Look carefully at what it says in Isaiah 24, 5. Look carefully, carefully, carefully at what it says. Isaiah 24, 5. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws and changed the ordinances and broken the everlasting covenant. Well, they broke the everlasting covenant at the beginning, did they not? In their pursuit to go against what the living God has set in motion, did they not break that in the beginning? Yes, they did. What is God's everlasting covenant binding? Anybody know what that is? He made that covenant. God is the, he only pleaded he didn't plead with New York and Canada and America and no other places. He pleaded with the inhabitants of the world over the issue of Israel. How does God plead? You know what it says? He will plead with him there in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Did, did, how does God plead? With fire, smoke, brimstone, great hail? That's how he pleads. And people start dying. That's how he pleads. That's how he's always pleaded. So when they go down there, death and destruction is going to be all over the place. That's why if you go back a little bit, you'll start to see it. Once you go back, you'll start to see that the armies of the earth are kaput. They're gone. Bye-bye. Nobody left, right? The armies are utterly destroyed. That's why you, when you see in the book of Joel, you see the same thing. There. Same thing happened. Somebody says rainbow. No, he didn't plead with the rainbow. He pleads with great hail, with fire, with absolute and utter destruction from the heavens. When God pleads, it's not man's doings. Every time God pleaded, stuff happened in the heavens. Nobody wants God to plead with them on any level because it is highly destructive. But what was the hope? That through going through a lot of hurt and pain and loss, they would consider their own ways. Remember when God said, why should I stricken you anymore? You'll just rebel more and more. You guys remember that? He was talking to Israel. He said, why should I stricken you anymore? Why should I do even worse to you? You'll just rebel more and more. Think about it. I'll tell you what one of the big problems is. Man has forgotten that they have a creator. That's number one. And that that creator, this is his earth. This is his creation. He has set things in motion. And man has gotten too big for his bridges. Somebody said, but if man breaks the man can't break the rainbow, the rainbow, that's impossible. The rainbow is nothing more than a prism showing through I said it, it's signum. You know what? When God said he gives the rainbow as a sign, do you guys know what that is? There's one condition that can cause a rainbow. You have to have atmosphere for that to happen. Not just atmosphere, but you have to have 
The atmosphere control in such a way that ice crystals are above, water droplets beneath, and then, you know, of course, the things on the bottom. So the atmosphere itself, without, it, we'd have no rainbow if we did not have certain layers of the atmosphere. So when God set a rainbow in the sky, if you know anything about uh, the atmospheres, when God set that rainbow in the so uh, sky as a sign to himself and to man that he would not flood the earth again, wouldn't that be the lower layers of the atmosphere, which means the atmosphere was different a long time ago. There is no rainbow without those lower levels. You have to have the lower levels of the, the atmosphere to form a rainbow or you will have no rainbow. Isn't that something? So the sign that God will not flood the earth again appears as a consequence of the Lord setting up the lower atmospheres. Now they know that back during the time of the giants, the atmospheres were different. They did not have the same atmospheres we have today. They already know that. So then the rainbow is a consequence of that other atmosphere. And when it appeared, it would be a sign, something that we could see to say, okay, God won't flood the earth again. And sure enough, because of the lower, because of the way the atmosphere works and the heat contained and the cycle of the atmospheres and the water and the lands, the earth can't be destroyed by a massive flood again. Why? Why couldn't that ever happen again? Because they're restrictive. The atmospheres are restrictive. And they won't let that much water circulate. Even if a bunch of water came into the ocean plains, the earth could probably stand maybe a half an inch of water over the whole surface. But there are going to be no more times when water is up there 40 days. That's not going to be again. Thank God for the atmospheres. And in order to have those atmospheres, the atmospheres don't just automatically stay up there. The atmospheres are a consequence of some of the cycles that happen in the earth. So these complete cycles give us the atmosphere and the atmosphere gives us the rest of those complete cycles it is one big huge cycle so god set things up like on a conveyor belt that they would always always give and take give and take give and take god did that and that's what that's for and that's how that works so uh you know there, there are certain things just because it's not mentioned and normally people gravitate towards fantastic things we forget about these foundational things very fast. But the more you know about these foundational things, well, that's a different story. Somebody said, is all this about our leader? No, all this is about you. All of what's happening on earth is about you. It's about you making an honest choice. Do you want to be part of the family of the living God or part of darkness? Every person has that choice. That's what all this on earth is about. Now, if we could see God with our eyes, all of us, would bow to our knees and fall. Even the worst of us would say, yes, Lord. So guess what the Lord did? He made himself scarce. And only by faith can you believe. Whenever you're put in a position where you have to believe something by faith, then what that does is you're not going to say yes to anything good out of fear. Again, if we could all see the living God, that's too much power to behold. All of us would fall to our knees and say, yes, Lord. Even Charles Manson would not be Charles Manson. He would suppress every evil and bad thing about himself out of true respect and fear of the Most High. Everything would. You take that authoritative figure away, then the teacher effectively left the classroom. Now, in a classroom, when the teacher goes away, what do you see? You see the child that wants to throw a spit wad. Nothing is holding him back, so he throws a spit wad. The child that wants to go over there and jump it up and down on the desk, that's what he does. When the teacher comes back and they don't announce it, what always happens? They always see that one kid sitting who's looking at everybody else and they don't they don't even want a part of throwing spit wads, jumping up and down or everything. The good child desires the teacher to come back. The bad children say, hey, no one's here. We can do what we want now. Which means they were suppressing everything evil about themselves. They suppressed it. When the teacher left, they're just showing everybody what they truly love. The good child, as soon as the teacher leaves, they actually enjoy the presence of the teacher. They're not throwing spit walls. They're not jumping up and down. They're not making a bunch of noise. They're just saying over and over in their heads, I can't wait until the teacher comes back. So the teacher comes back, and if they come back without notice, they're going to find out who's who very fast. Also, as soon as the teacher comes back, what does everybody do? They stop what they're doing, get down in their seats as though they never did anything. So the only way to catch uh, the bad kids is to not announce when you're coming back. 
you supply hope to the good children by giving them the season and say, well, you know, sometime in this hour, I'm going to be back. Now, a bad child, they get caught up in their own activities. Forget about the timing. They're always going to be caught unawares. The good child is looking at the clock the entire time. And the closer it gets to the teacher's arrival, all these bad kids hopping around, the good child is saying, ah, oh, I have hope it's getting close. They always say that. I have hope it's getting close. And when they really can't take any more, the teacher walks in and the good child is so relieved. They are actually relieved and happy to see the teacher. The kids who were jumping up and down, throwing spit wands and everything else, they're caught in the middle of the act and there's nothing they can say. But everybody sits down in their seats. Isn't that the same thing when the Lord returns? The same thing. And in his absence, what did he ask of us? To choose righteousness. So only those true children of the Most High are going to choose righteousness. Do you see that? God gives us examples of his entire word. There's so many things in this earth that a person can look at and see the truth of what he's talking about. It's not difficult. It's not hard to understand. God has given us absolute examples of just about everything if we would just have that sincere desire to see. That's what all this is about. Can you see? Oh. And as we get closer to the end, you're going to see the bad children do even more bad things. You're going to see them become what they actually are. And in a season that they're not thinking about, a time they're not aware of. Because why are they not aware of the time the teacher returns? Because they lost time in their own doings. They're so wrapped up in what they're doing, they can't even notice the season. They can't notice the indications. They're not watching the clock. They've forgotten about the clock. They forgot about everything, about the immediate activities they're involved in. What about the good children? The children, good children, don't want any part of the chaos that they see. They desire the teacher to come back. That's their comfort. The bad children, all they want to do is do their thing. The good child, well, they have good training. And they watch their clocks and they count the minutes because they want the teacher to come back. In the presence of the teacher, the good kids have comfort. But in the presence of the teacher, the bad kids suppress all their desires. 37 says, is Netanyahu next? Oh, there, there, there's no, uh, no, no mystery about that. They want him gone. And unfortunately, there are quite a few nations who want him gone now. So, folks... I'm just talking about the book of Daniel just a little bit. Hopped over into the book of Isaiah just a little bit. But letting you guys know that if I, the Iranian president is indeed dead, this is very troublesome because it puts us, it's going to put us in the middle of a higher chaotic time. It will support the ideologies of many enemies. Unlike times before, they will most certainly begin to conduct themselves in a warlike manner very sophisticated weapons and they will muster the support of many around them this is a key turn event if he is dead it's a large young group of soldiers that will accept nothing but revenge they will die for it. so this is quite serious in fact this is one of the most serious places the world has ever been in since the hour of Hiroshima and Nagasaki Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. 